Thanks, Anna. Um, hello, everyone, and thanks very much for the opportunity to speak today. Um, so my name is Sandra Henry, and I'm going to talk about the Cherish project. So I'm going to talk about some experiences we've had from Cherish, from in the field collecting data and undertaking research, and how we've worked with local communities and stakeholder groups, and then how we're seeing the work we undertake feed into heritage policy. So CHERISH itself is an acronym for Climate, Heritage and Environment of Reefs, Islands and Headlands. And the overarching aim of the CHERISH project is to raise awareness of climate change for Irish sea communities. And we're doing this through a number of different methods. So we're reconstructing past environments and weather history. We're discovering, assessing and mapping and monitoring heritage on land and beneath the sea. So in particular, we're targeting data and knowledge gaps, and we're also establishing new metrically accurate baseline data and recording standards. So it's a joint nation project. It's funded through the EU program Ireland Wales 2020. We have two project partners in Ireland, and the Discovery Program and the Geological Survey of Ireland. And then we work with our Welsh partners in Wales, the Royal Commission on the Ancient and Historical Monuments of Wales, along with the Geography and Earth Sciences Department at Aberystwyth University. So with CHERISH, we use a variety of different methodologies to record um, heritage within the marine zone and coastal zone. So some of our airborne methods include commissioning LIDAR data, or the capture of LIDAR data sets. Then we also undertake aerial survey of all the different case study areas in which we work in. We undertake UFE surveys. We do this as concentrated surveys for particular sites, along with investigating wider landscapes. And then we're also exploring the use of satellite mapping. In the marine zone, we're collecting multi-beam echo sounder data, and this allows us to image the seafloor, along with imaging wreck sites. And we have underwater archaeologists who work on targeted wreck sites. And for our terrestrial work, we're collecting laser scan data for built heritage sites along with cliff faces. We are collecting precision, precision data through GNSS survey. We're also undertaking paleo-environmental coring and sampling along with luminescence dating. And we're undertaking geophysical survey along with excavation and dating programs. So the infographic on the right hand side shows areas we're working in in Ireland and Wales. Um, today I'm going to talk about predominantly the work we're undertaking in Ireland, but the work the Church undertakes is mirrored on both sides of the Irish Sea. So for the Irish case study areas, we define them by stakeholder engagement initially, and this is something we have continued to do throughout the project. And was to engage with stakeholders and also to get guidance of stakeholders on the type of data that's to be collected. So what we started to address was um, data knowledge gaps. Then we identified areas of soft and eroding coastlines alongside areas of hard coastlines where we were seeing cliff, cliff, excuse me, cliff collapse and other um, negative impacts. Then we have used predictive modeling to also guide our study areas and also the potential to collaborate with existing projects and target areas and priorities that have been, that have been identified. And I'm going to just talk a little bit about one of the landscapes in which we're working in. It's at Balsgat Bay. This is located in the southwest of Kerry. And so it's on the Ebra Peninsula. And Balsgat Bay, has been one of the landscapes in which we've undertaken work in and the UNESCO World Heritage Site of Skellig Michael actually lies just off Balan Skellig Bay. So in the 11th century, due to various stresses on the monastery of Skellig, it was actually transferred to the North Shore here at Balan Skellig Bay. So the, the type of UFE data sets that we've collected so far have been um, landscape data sets looking at the intertidal and coastal zone, and we've collected over 10 kilometers of data. We've also targeted priority sites, such as Balanskelix Abbey and Castle. So on the right-hand side, you can see the laser scan survey that was undertaken at the castle, so that we had the elevation sections and profiles of the castle in which to monitor change over time. 
And then we have a number of areas where we undertook concentrated UAC surveys of areas that were particularly of interest to us due to the significance of the built and archaeological heritage in these areas. We also have undertaken paleo-environmental work in the Bay. We have co taken cores at four different sites. And so the, the basal uh, dates of these peak cores are showing a range for the formation of the wetlands around the Bay from 6,500 years ago to 3,900 years ago. And these peak cores will also provide us with environmental and climate records for the Bay since um, the Neolithic period and also the, it will inform on the formation of the bay over time. So if we move a little further north in County Kerry, we have another site that we're working on, it's Ferter's Castle and Promontory Fort. Promontory forts are predominant coastal site type in Ireland, and they have been identified previously as being one of the most at-risk sites in Ireland. So we've decided to undertake an excavation here at Ferter's, as the information we garnish from this excavation won't just apply locally, but also will inform us on promontory forts throughout Ireland as well, and should provide bigger insights into the knowledge base for the study of promontory forts. So in the digital elevation models, and um, in the blue and green images here on the screen, you can see that a number of archaeological structures and layers are currently eroding or have already collapsed into the sea. So what we've done is we've identified similar structures on the interior of the fort, which we will um, investigate and excavate to gain further understanding of the nature of these structures. And we've also um, identified a number of areas for exploratory trenches, and we'll also undertake core transects of different features with promontory fort in order to gain insights into the construction of the site. And we also have at the outer defences of this promontory fort a tower house that's probably 15th or 16th century. And again, we have a laser scan survey undertaken of this structure to see how it changes over the course of the project. So with Cherish, um, everywhere we work, we intertwine with the local community uh, due to the knowledge base of the local communities, information they can give us. Also, we can by interacting with the communities, we can see what's important to them, how the work we do can feed into their aims and objectives for the heritage within their areas. So this is, these images kind of show a number of examples of the type of outreach activities that we do in the Cherish project, and also the type of groups that we, in, we uh, connect with in order to, um, to hold these events. So on the left hand side, we have a field walking event with um, interested individuals and members of the local community in North County Dublin. And we actually undertook this survey with um, Bengal County Council. Then we also undertake community tours of our site. This can be seen here at the site in the centre image of the site down simply in Wales. And then we also tie in with already established community groups. So King Coast is a national um, group that's present throughout Ireland, and we've tied in with them on a number of occasions to undertake heritage and geology tours alongside beach cleans. So we're interacting with communities that are already present in the coastal zone. So the, how we try to um, disseminate the information is by training these coastal communities along with sharing knowledge and also receiving knowledge from them and in order to raise awareness of the climate change impacts they're currently and happen in their areas. So we also create reusable resources and they're all open set, open source data sets and we have management plans and best practice guidance. So Cherish, as I mentioned earlier, we engage with experts and stakeholders in all different communities we work in as this ensures the output of meaningful project deliverables. So from the outset, we've um, always tied in with uh, different public bodies and professional organisations in the Irish heritage sector. So here I have a list of some of the bodies we work with, and um, there's obviously quite a few more, but this just gives an idea of um, the different departments within the government that we work with and try to align our priorities with theirs. So the church data has fed into the climate change sectorial adaptation plan for built archaeological heritage that was released in 2019. And so 
This plan identified five key adaptation goals, and this include impro included improving understanding of each heritage source and its vulnerability to climate change impacts, along with developing and developing mainstream sustainable policies and plans for climate change adaptation of built and archaeological heritage to conserve Ireland's heritage for future generations, communicate and transfer knowledge and exploit the opportunities for built and archaeological heritage to demonstrate value and secure resources. So church project members sit on both the Climate Change Advisor Group and the Climate Change Planning Team. So the climate change planning team is responsible for the coordination and implementation of the climate change sectorial adaptation plan and then also to ensure other relevant sectors are kept informed of the plan's progress to ensure cross benefits between plans are fully realized. Okay, so that's everything from me. Thank you for listening.